Since Mark Teske worked here as the director of the Truth and Love program for a number of years, I feel like I should not have to introduce him that much. Um, that most of you probably know him to some degree, and some of you I will know him well enough. Well, we will collect stories later. I have the opportunity, however, to know Mark in a very different way uh, because uh, he's been working now with GBN in uh, Olive Branch, Mississippi for a number of years and uh, is director of operations there. And when he asked me to come and to record a few lessons a couple of years ago, uh, just to try on things for size, you know, uh, that was an experience that led to my program there going regularly and staying with Mark and Michelle in their home to have their hospitali hospitality extended to me and to see how Mark works to make that program work and to benefit uh, the brotherhood in that way. And several of us are involved in, with him in that in a number of ways. But also he now serves as an elder of the congregation at South Haven, uh, Mississippi. And appreciate uh, the responsibility there and the wisdom that requires. And so while you know him as the good man that he is, the graduate of the school, uh, and, but also he has done a number of good things uh, since that time, and we're very thankful for that work in the kingdom. And based upon these things, I think we can have confidence in looking forward to the lesson he will now give us on give me a congregation like the Thessalonians. As Kevin reminds me, 35 minutes... Uh, you know, we didn't have a song because the speaker before me went over time a little bit. <laughs> if that ain't the pot calling the kettle black. <laughs> well, I have to say, it's good to be home. Love and appreciate the good brethren in, uh, in Mississippi, and we have enjoyed our time there, and... Uh, uh, have developed many close friendships, but uh, I got to say, we get past Texarkana, it's good to be home. And a lot of that's because of people in this room. Love and appreciate you very, very much. The Thessalonian congregation is a congregation that probably shouldn't have been. When you look at it from a, a pure worldly basis, this congregation should never have happened. If, if we look back at how it was established, you know, back in, in Acts chapter 16, uh, the Macedonian call brought Paul and Silas uh, to Philippi where they uh, got to be on a first-name uh, first basis with the Philippian jailer. Why? Because they spent the night in his prison after they had been beaten. When they move on from Philippi, they come to Thessalonica. And chapter 17, verse 2, that tells us they spent a grand total of three weeks in Thessalonica before they got run out of that town. On to Berea, where they stayed for a short time. You know, we, a lot of times we remember uh, verse 11 about those noble Bereans who were more noble and fair-minded than those in Thessalonica, in that they searched the scriptures with all readiness daily to find out whether these things were so. Going back to English class, that's not talking about the Christians, that's talking about the Jews. The Jews in Berea were more fair-minded than the Jews in Thessalonica, who happened to be the ones who ran Paul and Silas out of town. And once they got to Berea, guess what? Those same Thessalonian Jews came to Berea to run him out of that town. So here we have his time in Thessalonica in the midst of this time of being run out of perfectly good towns, one after another after another. 
and he only had three weeks with the people there to establish the church, and then they're gone. From a start like that, after Berea, Paul goes down to Athens, makes his way over to Corinth. And from there in Corinth, that's where he pens this letter, probably the first of the written epistles that we have in Scripture. First Thessalonians to these brand new Christians that didn't have much time to, to learn about Christianity to grow in the faith. But notice with me, if you will, the way the letter begins. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. He begins by telling him, I remember you in my prayers, always giving thanks to God for you. Verse 3, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope in Christ Jesus, in our Lord Christ Jesus, in the sight of our God and Father. Great words of praise for these brethren. He remembers them first off for their work of faith. You see, faith is a work. Jesus explained that in John chapter 6, verse 29. Faith itself is a work. But faith also leads to work. It drives us to do things. That's what uh, James was trying to get across in James chapter 2, beginning in verse 14 on through the end of the chapter. And he gets to, to verse 20 and he says, Don't you know faith without works is dead? Faith and works have to go together. We get to Hebrews chapter 11, that famous chapter on faith, by faith, somebody heard what God said. Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing, hearing from the word of God. They heard what was said and they obeyed it. That faith became alive. That faith began to work. Faith that is alive does something. And I think sometimes we, we understand that on a rational basis, but when it gets to operating it, sometimes we lose sight of that. Sometimes we just take things for granted. Case in point, I can tell each one of you has faith in the ceiling over our heads. There's thousands of pounds of wood and other materials on top of that, precariously perched. I can tell you have faith in that. Because if we didn't believe that that was going to stay up, you would be right behind me running out that door. But you see, our faith is so ingrained in us our understanding this roof's going to stay up, we don't even think about it. And that's one of the signs of mature faith. When we believe and it so much becomes a part of us that we don't even have to think about it. Where are you going to be tomorrow morning? Huh. Sunday morning. What am I going to do? Do you have to ask yourself that question each and every Sunday? Or is it so ingrained? It's a work that just happens. I don't think about it. I don't decide about it. It just happens. This is what I do. This is who I am. A work of faith. So we've got a congregation of people 
that have, has a faith, each and every one of them, that works. That's driving their actions. That's keeping them going. But notice he goes on to say, your work of faith, also your labor of love. Two different words here, work and labor. You see that, that word for work is that standard level of work, uh, the, the normal stuff that we go through. This word for labor, labor of love, different word. This is, that, this is the tough stuff, that agonizing toil. This is when it gets hard. That's the type of labor we're talking about here. A labor of love. How do you get people to work so hard? It's easy if they're motivated out of love. It is. I'd like to introduce you to a young man, very near and dear to my heart. It's my grandson. I love him to death. Don't believe me? I'll show you pictures. I am fully convinced the reason he is so sweet, so precious, and so darling is because every nasty thing that has ever been in that boy's body has come out the bottom end. And somebody's got to wipe it. What do you do? You don't think about it. Why? Motivated out of love. That boy can get in some messes. He can really, he can make a mess. But we think about a labor of love. Why in the world do we do those things? Motivated out of love. A kid wakes up 3 o'clock in the morning, spewing bodily fluids all out of every orifice, Running a fever, cranky, what are you going to do? My shift doesn't start for another four hours. We're going to take care. Why? We're motivated out of love. I love that little guy so much. Whatever it takes, I'm going to do. Now let's think about that in the context of a congregation. A group of Christians that are laboring out of love. What's that going to look like? Will it look like this? Well, you know, I did that for, for years and nobody ever said thank you to me. Is that labor of love? I don't know who it is here that does this, but somebody has to empty the garbage can in the nursery. And if you don't empty it quickly, it's going to get nasty in there very quickly. Whoever does that, thank you. But I go far to say is whoever's doing that would do it whether or not I ever said thank you. A labor of love. People willing to roll up their sleeves and do what it takes, working hard, working, as, as doing as much as they can, motivated because this is what's best for the church, this is what's best for the kingdom. It doesn't matter if anybody recognizes me, it doesn't matter if anybody acknowledges I've done it, why am I going to do it? Because it needs doing. Give me a congregation filled with Christians with that attitude. 
Paul said, that's what I remember about you all in Thessalonica. Give me a church like that. Their labor of love, their patience of hope, uh, their uh, work of faith, labor of love, and their patience of hope. That word for patience... As Brother Avon Malone used to, used to uh, tell us all the time, hoopamane. That's, well, you see, when we think of patience, patience in our minds is when you go by Walmart during the Christmas season and you don't punch anybody standing in, in the two lot, checkout lines that are open. Boy, I was patient. I didn't lose it when I was driving down the freeway. That's not this word for patience. This is different. But back when we were teaching Marissa how to drive, uh, she did that in Mississippi. And uh, while she was learning... You know, uh, student driver, people, they're obnoxious at times. Cutting you off, going here, going there, honk your horn and speed around, whatever they want to do. She was this kind of patient. Driving right along. His wife must be having a baby, needs to get to the hospital. We'll let him go. Oh, she must have something very, very important going on. We'll, We'll just let her be. And she could just smile through it all. That's the patience here. Joyful endurance in the face of tribulation. In case you're wondering, she's kind of gotten over that a little bit now. (laughs) But that patient endurance, I can do this and I can do this with a smile on my face. Why? Patience of hope. Looking forward to what's ahead. After I graduated from school here, I worked for a while in Kentucky. And I met a woman in the congregation. And she's she's since passed away, but she gave me permission. I could tell the story. Mary was married to Robert. Robert was in, in very bad health. And she would work with him, kept him in the home, doing everything she could for him. And and would get to the point, they they were up in years, get to the point where she would just wear herself down, get sick, have to go to the hospital. And while she was in the hospital, Robert would have to go to the nursing home. She'd recuperate herself, get home as quick as she can, get Robert back there in the home and take care of her. She was laboring selflessly, doing everything she could for her husband. And this cycle went on several times until eventually Robert passed away. After conducting the funeral, came back to the house to have a sandwich. Sitting down at the table, the phone rings. It's Mary's daughter. She said, Mama was pulling out a chair, having dinner for us. She fell and we think she broke her hip. They've just taken her to the emergency room. So just as quick as I can, get to the emergency room, walk in there, and the doctor is coming out. Uh, He he and I were friends. I asked him, hey, how is Mary doing? He said, it's broken. We're going to have to do surgery in the morning. And I thought to myself, okay, deep breath, get control of myself. This woman just lost her husband, just buried him today. She's broken her hip, and she's going to have to have surgery. Talk about the life of Job. Got myself prepared, walked into the room, and Mary's laying there on the bed with a big old smile on her face. I said, how are you, Mary? She said, oh, Brother Mark... I am blessed. And I'm thinking to myself, yeah, morphine is a wonderful drug. (laughs) 
I said, Mary, why are, why are you so blessed? She said, Brother Mark, I have been praying for years to have the strength and the ability to care for Robert. God answered my prayer. And this morning, I did the last thing I had to do for him. And my hip stayed together till I had accomplished that. I am blessed. You could have knocked me over with a feather. Patience of hope. That hope, that expectation of what's ahead for us. What we have to look forward to as a child of God, we look forward to heaven. That wonderful blessing, that rest that we have at the end of our journey. And when I keep my eyes focused on that prize, what can this world do to me? I've realized in the last few years, I'm getting older. And not a surprise to anybody here, shouldn't be. But this old body starts wearing out. There's things I used to do and not even think about. <laughs> i got to stop and think a minute. Do I really want to pay the price for doing that? Can I even get it done? Our body's going to wear out. People are going to disappoint us. Somebody's going to sin against you. Do you know what we call that? Life. Patience of hope. When I keep my eyes focused on that prize, I realize that anything I'm having to do right now is temporary. It's going, it's going to vanish like a vapor. It's gone. That's not just the good things, that's the bad things. Keep my eyes focused on heaven. And I know what the reward is. And when I have that focus, Whatever life brings, I can endure it with a smile on my face. Patience of hope. What a wonderful, wonderful observation about the church there in Thessalonica. The second letter to the Thessalonians, written not too long thereafter. Chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Notice these three things that Paul commends them for again. These were characteristics that truly describe this congregation, not just at one point in time, but was something that was ongoing. Give me a congregation that works based on faith, that labors out of love, that has patience of hope. Paul, by inspiration, goes on. Verses 7 through 9. Notice here at the end in verse 9, he says, how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. He's talking here about a true conversion of these Christians. Their lives changed completely because of their Christianity. And Kevin talked about this some in the previous lesson, trying to get us to understand that transformation, that change that occurs. You know, sometimes there's not a whole lot that needs to be changed. You know, sometimes we have young people growing up in the church, good surroundings, they're, they're, they're good kids, occasionally do something wrong. They don't have a lot to change. Don't sell them short. Oh, he's a good kid. Wonderful. 
But a good kid doesn't necessarily mean a good Christian. Has he converted? Sure, there may be a lot of things in his life. There's not a lot of things that he has to get rid of. But what has he taken on? What is he doing? How has it changed his life? Is he engaging in the things he needs to engage in? I think we lose this sometimes. Oh, you know, good kid, become a, a Christian, they got baptized, and off they go, off to college and beyond. And tragically, too often we lose them. Why? Because they weren't converted. It's not just getting rid of the bad things. What do you have? Why do you come to worship? Do you come to worship just because mom and dad say so? Or do you have built within you a desire to worship the living God? If you don't have that desire, if you don't build in your children and your grandchildren that desire, they haven't been converted. There's still work to be done. There's a brother back home. He became a child of God about two and a half years ago. And if you would see him in an alley, I don't care who you are, you'd get nervous. Tattoos, big beard, big burly guy. Became a Christian. Let me tell you, he converted. He's changed. Not just the things he gave up, but what he has done, what he has embraced. Chance came for him to take an evangelism class. He was the first one to sign up. It wasn't even in our congregation. It was a different congregation. He said, I want to be a part of that. And he did. And he hasn't stopped yet. He sees a chance for a study. He's there. A dear friend of mine came and talked to me a while back. His daughter, married, had a couple of beautiful girls. Her husband was an alcoholic. Just undergone treatment. Starting to reevaluate his life. I think this is a chance somebody can study with this man. My daughter's been unfaithful for years. Who can reach him? Oh, I knew exactly who could reach him. Hey, could you study with them? Oh, I'd love to study with them. Understood what they were going through. And now one of the most faithful families in attendance. Because of this brother who's been a Christian for two and a half years, spending the time studying. The, the father in that family had been an alcoholic, mended his ways. He's been sober for months now. He is now active in the church. Life headed in the right direction. Through the process of the study, the wife said, Hey, I don't think I really was baptized for the right reasons. I need to be baptized. Mother and father, those girls raised up in a Christian family. Why? Because of this new Christian willing to teach others. Conversion. And I challenge you to consider yourself, have I been converted? Am I doing the things that I could be doing? Notice here what Paul says about the Thessalonians. From you the word of the Lord is sounded forth not only in Macedonia and Achaia but also in every place. 
you get a group of Christians who are truly converted, who are interested in the souls of others, and what happens? They turn the world on its ear. Give me an evangelistic congregation like Thessalonica. People interested not only in their area, but spreading the gospel throughout. That's the kind of congregation I want to be a part of. But notice also, you became examples to all. Remember, this is 1 Thessalonians, written to this congregation where Paul and Silas were with them for three weeks, run out of town, hadn't been gone long, sending this letter back to help teach them some things they hadn't, uh, hadn't been able to teach them yet. And already, you became examples to all. These are people who are changing. These are people who are growing. These are people who are evangelizing. And in their town, there's Jews not only interested in hurting the church there, but they'll go out of town to hurt the church, down to Berea. What a wonderful, wonderful thing to be able to say about this young congregation. Give me a congregation like these Thessalonians. They have potential. But they also have results. Toward the end of the book. But concerning brotherly love. You have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves are taught by God to love one another, and indeed you do so toward all the brethren who are in all Macedonia. You have that love one for another. Not only there in the congregation, but outside the congregation. To others in the area. Your love shows out to others. And isn't that the way Christians are supposed to be? How do, how do, how do people know you as a Christian? Is it because of your love? Should be. Is it because you can argue stronger than anybody else on social media why everybody else is wrong? I don't read that in scripture. By their love. Now when we love somebody, there's times we're going to have to deal with doctrinal error. But we do that with patience. There's going to be times we're going to have to have those difficult conversations. But they better be based in love with everybody understanding the reason this is occurring, the reason I do this, the reason what motivates me in all that I do is my concern for your well-being. That's the type of love we need to have. That's what we need to be known for in all that we do. When you add all this up for this congregation in Thessalonica, isn't that a wonderful congregation? Don't you see some things there? You say, oh, that is wonderful. But I've got to be honest with you. I don't have to go to Thessalonica to see some of these same qualities. I see many of these qualities in this room right now. I see many of these things that have helped me. These attitudes, these approaches, sometimes these words of, hey, you need to get something straight. 
Thank you. This is not unique to Thessalonica. These are qualities we have and we can see in our lives today. And the lives of those around us. But notice what he says here in verse 10. We urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more. Allow me to give Mark's paraphrase. You can't do too much of this. Keep, grow, do more and more. Can you love too much? Can you labor from love too much? Can your faith work too much? Can you have too much patience because of your hope? Can you evangelize too much? Can you love too much? Grow. Thank you so very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Mark.